Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twip. In your nightmares, in the deep, in your favorite horror movies, but not in your living room, on your TV. Don't let pay TV be the monster in your living room. Pay TV and cable TV companies are seeking the right to charge you for the very programs you now get free. If you want to stop pay TV and save free television, sign the petition in the lobby of this theater. Let your lawmakers know how you feel in the fight against pay TV and cable TV. It's frame rate. Welcome to Frame Rate, episode 73. I'm Tom Merritt. Hi, I'm Brian Brushwood. And we are joining the fight against pay TV. Pay TV. I love the, I love the propagandist attitude of it. Like, it's just the worst thing ever. Like, oh, cable is just it's the end of the world. Right, and like it was going to be legislated. It wouldn't be an option for you to go buy it. They would just force you to pay for your television. The well, man dude, would come to your door. And- your horrible vision became a reality. Now we all have to pay for our products and our services. It's terrible. Yeah. What's um, uh, uh, Michael Crichton said? I, I'm going to bur- butcher the quote, but it was something like, uh, there's nothing more sobering than a 10-year-old newspaper headline. It's like, if you look at what everyone's worried about 10 years ago, it's all idiocy. It's all names you don't even remember and things that never came to pass, which just sort of makes you relax about news today. That's interesting. 2002 would be 10 years ago, right? And, yeah, we'll and, and we were worried about uh, uh, Napster. Ter- <laughs> and Napster was going to ruin it. Was gonna, we were not going to have any more music. Yeah, no. Ever it's, again. It's, it's, and we didn't. We, music went away. The music finally died, Tom. The day, it was the day the music died, for real. Yeah. You can't even sing Don McLean's song. It's against the law. <laughs> Actually, that's probably true. <laughs> Without paying. Uh, Well, we uh, have a big story. Uh, (laughs) This just in, the big story. Uh, A big story that wants you to pay even more for your television, but make it a whole lot more convenient. Yeah, no, I am 100% okay with this story. This is like, it's, it's as though somebody made a story completely out of frame rate. Well, yeah. Now, this is this is really interesting, and Ayaz and I were kind of struggling to to wrap our heads around it when we talked about it on Tech News today, because because details, deep details, are a little thin on the ground. Uh, but essentially, according to a New York Times story in a press release from a company called Nimble TV at nimbletv.com, they're aiming to do Aereo one better. So, it's Aereo, if you remember, is going to have mini antennas in a place, and then over the internet, stream to you free over the air broadcasts for a small fee. What Nimble TV is going to do is actually subscribe you to your whatever cable television or satellite service you would like and right. then stream that over the internet to you. And they keep comparing it to Slingbox or TV Anywhere. Slingbox, of course, the device that lets you stream your home television over the internet to yourself anywhere in the world. And TV Anywhere is the uh, cable industry's attempt to allow you to get your cable uh, service over the internet anywhere you are. So uh, is this a case where Aereo is going to take the the initial brunt of the legal attacks? I, mean, I guess, you know, Zadiva got knocked down, Aereo well, is going to find out, and now we're just, floodgates are open, and we're going to see more startups <laughs> figure. I, I think this is the mistake we made on TAT yesterday. Before we jump right into the lawsuits, yeah. uh, let's, uh, let's talk about what Nimble TV is doing. Uh, uh, 
and what we don't know what they're doing because because there's some interesting stuff here. They're backed by Greylock Partners, Tribune Company, and one other uh, venture capital firm. So they've got some industry backing, a la Aereo, right? Aereo is a, is a uh, Barry Diller-backed company. Right. They are using the Cablevision precedent, uh, where Cablevision won a court case that said that they could stream the DVR over the cable service to the home. So you wouldn't have to locate the actual DVR in the house. Court says, no, that's, that's okay. That's not rebroadcasting. Uh, right. Slingbox has never been found to be violating rebroadcasting rules. So they're saying, look, we're basically doing what Slingbox does. We're going to have a box in our location that will stream your cable television service to you. The cable TV and satellite companies will get their money. You'll have, yeah. to, you'll have to pay them. So they can't complain that they're, not, they're getting cut out of the deal because they're getting paid. And you'll pay an extra $20 for the convenience of being able to watch this anywhere in the world. It's the equivalent of instead of having a sling box and a cable box in your house, you, uh, it's the equivalent of saying, well, instead of having a remote network drive in my house, I'm going to use Dropbox or I'm going to use Carbonite to do my backup. I'm going to pay extra money so that I don't have to deal with managing the hardware or the network. So right. that all sounds good. But what I has found at nimbletv.com is a little uh, is a little thing up on their homepage that says want to watch uh, programming from other countries we'll sign you up give you an address and then you can stream that well that ain't legal that's going to get them in a whole hot big boiling pot of hot water because so- th- that is what ha- has taken down things like film on was they were taking regional broadcasts within the United States and making them available to people outside those regions. Aereo has been very careful to say we are going to respect the geographic boundaries. If you go even one further and say, oh, yeah, we'll send you the UK, you know, we'll, we'll fake an address in the UK and then send that, uh, and send that to you, they're going to get in a whole lot of legal hot water. Now, maybe they figure they're, they're ironclad because they're going to have an address and they've got found a loophole, but people are going right. to come after them. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's no doubt in my mind that there will be some kind of legal repercussions for this. But it's isn't it amazing how there's so clearly a market for this, that consumers so clearly want it, that company after company just bravely and brazenly starts walking out, trying to provide the service, hoping that that maybe one of these will be able to find the, the right legal hoops to jump through. And I think Aereo is pretty is is, is going to pull it off. Uh, but uh the nimble tv thing I, I i don't ever understand why it should be illegal or why it should invite a lawsuit well yeah that's a whole that's a whole different conversation right i mean exactly. uh, and 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 we could get into that and we have gotten into that before but right. what what's really cu- what's what's raised the curiosity level on nimble tv is they they look like they're doing something that could actually be the stepping stone to us having cable television delivered directly right cable tv's kind of kicking and screaming, dragging its heels, trying to get you TV anywhere. They're like, TV anywhere. Uh, don't, don't go to the internet for your, for your video. Use your cable television. We'll make it available in your house, sort of. Right. But <laughs> then sometimes we won't. And, and, and it's, it's just broken, and that's why it hasn't caught on, because they put way too many restrictions. This company's saying, hey, we have a legal precedent that allows us to locate the hardware remotely, but still stream it to you. And then you get... You basically get the the, uh, the elements of a sling box. We haven't talked about whether it's worth twenty dollars a month extra on top of your already, you know, rather steep cable right. bill or not. But maybe. But, but tell me, uh, does it bring? It says DVR functionality. D- does it work like the way my physical cable box DVR works? Is I have to know that I like a certain program in advance and make sure to subscribe to it so that I can have it recorded and watch it later. Uh, so it's not quite the same as on demand where it's like I hear after the fact that, um, you know, Legend of Korra is awesome and I want to go find the episodes. Uh, is there any description of how the actual service works in that regard, whether or not you'll get uh, it's only stuff that you subscribe to that you would have DVR capabilities versus uh, versus just being able to go grab old programs? Well, there is a video on YouTube uh, from a research company that demonstrates it. And all it shows you is is the interface. And Nimble has their own interface that allows you to do searching and find things. I couldn't tell from this whether you're going to be able to access the normal on-demand uh, features of, say, a Comcast or a DirecTV. Uh, but mm-hmm. it, it, it does allow you to do searching. It allows you to set uh, recording of programs. You get unlimited storage, according to the Nimble TV website. So you could 
essentially, I mean, you do kind of have to know ahead of time, but with reruns, etc., you could you could definitely fake it. But I don't, yeah, I don't know if you've got the uh, the on demand uh, situation or not. Uh, let's hurry past the baseball footage so we don't get this pulled off. Uh, <laughs> go, go, go. Oh, my God, they stay on baseball forever. Um, stop, stop saying the word baseball. They're listening. They're listening. Olympics. Ah! Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the, the interface is kind of cool. And it, it gives a lot of added search functionality that you might not get from your normal service. Uh, I, I still, I think they should stop short of pushing this idea that I can get, you know, Things from UK or India uh, in the in the United States because they're going to give me an address in those those countries. I think that's just inviting trouble. Uh, yeah, although I wonder if uh, my guess is if they've got the if they feel like they're on solid ground for providing the service legally, they maybe they feel they they're on solid ground for. I guess doing so. The- yeah, I mean, they did say in the New York Times article that they feel they they will not be sued, which I think is optimistic. There was an analyst who said, "Oh no, they're going to be they're going to be sued." Uh, but but if they didn't do that, if they didn't advertise that part of the service, I think they'd be on really solid ground. I, I, they might still somebody might still come after them just because. So, but uh, you bring up a good a good uh, point when you talk about like whether it's worth twenty dollars. Uh, twenty dollars that's that's two hundred and forty dollars a year just to have essentially an interface layer to make it convenient to watch your content any way you want. I, and I got to tell you, I I actually think I would pay it at, at least for a while. To give a try because as I've you heard me complain before, it's I, I can't I don't even use my DVR. I can't bring myself to remember stupid codes for channels, and I, I have no idea what channel anything's on, and I don't want to know. And if this could make it possible for me to not to have to, yeah, I spent twenty bucks on that. Well, it's not. I don't know if it's going to fix that or not. I mean, it it definitely is. You're still going to have to program DVR stuff. But, but it's not going to give you anything you don't already get from your cable company. Right, but but I I've got to imagine that the UI being able to control it on you know my computer and and you know not having a you know deep, deep, deep and scroll through a billion things on a remote control. Uh, I mean I I guess that's that, I don't know is the thing, but it's like it'd be worth it to try. I, I think. Yeah, and well, and I think two hundred forty bucks for for a sling box. You know that's not the cheapest one they sell, but that's kind of the 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 mid range price there. Uh, versus twenty bucks a year, which is two hundred forty bucks for a year. But you don't have to manage it yourself, and limited you know, storage, yeah, and it's you know it's I, I I think it might be worth it. Maybe not <clears throat> maybe not for everyone, but uh, but it it might be worth it. Let's uh, let's move on to another big story because Hollywood's gonna die. <laughs> Stop everything! It's another big story. At least Jimmy Wales thinks that Hollywood's going to die. Uh, well, at least he thinks they're doomed. He was delivering a keynote address at the Internet Society's INET convention in Geneva and said, Hollywood will be destroyed and no one will notice. Uh, it, he, he basically says collaborative storytelling and filmmaking will do to Hollywood what Wikipedia did to Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, Encyclopedia Britannica is actually doing a really good job. They don't print the encyclopedia anymore uh, right. and and they went through some some devastating layoffs and and such over the past 20 years but they're making money and yeah. and they're doing well online so i don't know if they're the best example but i get his point which is no, I, we're I, going I, I, to we're going to see everybody making their own stuff and that's going to drive hollywood to its knees right okay and essentially what he's saying and if First of all, I think it's a fine example of it because regardless of whether it retains the same name, it's it's not in any way the same company that it was 30 years ago. I mean, we have definitely seen the death of uh, Encyclopedia Britannica as you and I knew it growing up and certainly with them as, as, as a dominant player. But uh, I think uh, all, all excessive rhetoric aside, I think he's 100 percent right in that he's calling out just what's right in front of our faces. At this point, the talent for storytelling is getting so good on the amateur market. The tools for high quality production values are uh, are so uh, cheap and affordable that all of a sudden uh, anyone can create really, really good content. And with that in mind, how on earth do you justify the $100 million to spend to make a movie like Battleship and then the $200 million extra to tell everyone that they're going to die unless they go watch the Battleship movie. Like, it's 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 an unsustainable uh, model given the fact that there is such quality coming from uh, the outside now. I disagree. What? 
I, Not I, I don't 100% disagree, but I think we're too quick to jump to, oh, but people can do it themselves now, and that was the only thing stopping people from, from creating because, you know, it was all in the hands of the man. I don't think it works that way, and I don't think we've seen it work that way. When the printing press came along, we like to think, oh, well, printing press, that's much, much too expensive. But the fact of the matter is, when the printing press came along, everybody said the same thing. Aha, now it's not in the hands of the monks anymore. Anybody can go out and print things. And, and, and there was a, 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 a very thriving pamphleteer community. And in fact, that community still exists, but we don't value them. When we see people handing out printed pamphlets, we're like, oh, that's just somebody doing it themselves. You know, we as humans want to see that stamp of quality. We want to see some authority behind it still. And so I, do, I definitely think Jimmy Wales has a point, is that storytelling is going to change and the landscape is going to change. But I, I think Hollywood will not die. I think Hollywood will continue. They will painfully, slowly adapt, but they will continue because there is brand identification you know, you may say, I don't, I don't agree with that in our audience, but there are plenty of people who say, well, I'm not going to go see some crappy homemade movie. I'm gonna, I want to see something that the pros make. And that will, that will sustain them. It'll, but I agree with you, it will change the way Hollywood makes things. We won't necessarily see things like Battleship. We won't see these Hollywood blockbusters mass-produced every summer. Uh, and I don't know exactly how it's going to change. It is going to change. But I don't think Hollywood is just going to be destroyed at all. Okay, and understand. Maybe uh, let's say let's say Hollywood as its current business model of this one size fits all shovelware. You know, this will be the big movie that you will enjoy this this summer. Uh, it's got to it's got to go away. Something has to change on it. What, try this on for size. What about uh, the music industry has vastly vastly changed because of uh, the access to the, the you know distribution and the fact that anyone can make any kind of, of music very easily now. And as a result, there's massive fragmentation. And uh, Thriller was the number one selling album in the mid-80s. Nothing's going to beat it, not for decades and decades, because that was the time when it was one size fits all. And it was like, this is going to be the mega thing that everyone loves. And instead, we've got new genres of music with, that, that didn't even exist before. We've got uh, increasingly fragmented markets to where you could be, you could be you know, lord of, of a category that didn't even exist 20 years ago. And I think that's what I'm saying you're going to see with filmmaking. You're going to see types of movies that didn't even exist and types of storytelling and, and the era of, of, you know, these, the, these, these mega dominant movies is, I, I think that is what is going to have a hard time surviving this transition because they're so expensive and they are such big gambles and they rely on everybody going and seeing it. And I don't know that you could cause that anymore when uh, when you could make really high quality movies for $20 million a piece or even a million dollars a piece, even $10,000 a piece. Well, and don't forget that as the cost of movies goes down, it goes down for Hollywood too, right? Yes. So a well, lot of the... I mean, I, a not, lot of a lot of, their, their major, no, no. their biggest expenses, Hollywood's biggest expenses is not the tools or the cameras. It's the talent, and that cost is not going to go down. It's the marketing, and that cost is not going to go down. They spend way more on the marketing for a movie than they do on the actual creation of the movie itself. And that's not sustainable under this new paradigm. Well, is what and, I and because it's not sustainable, that's why I think the cost is going to go down. The cost of talent will go down. The cost of marketing will go down. They will stop spending that money. They don't want to, but they will realize, well, shoot, we need to get on Twitter. We need to market the same way that these indies are marketing. The same way indie film changed Hollywood in the late 80s and 90s, this is going to change Hollywood too. They are going to say, you know what, we can't afford to pay all of this talent this much. And it'll, again, slowly and painfully, but as new talent emerges, they will set a new standard. Like, oh yeah, the days of the... Multi-million dollar contracts are over. Sorry. Yeah, Julia Roberts, she's still going to get that, you know, because that's what her agent uh, expects. But, you know, as she gets older and does fewer movies, you know, those, those contracts are going to go away. Sorry, dude. And, is- and it's going to be, look, we have all of these people who are training themselves out there. You don't want to take uh, the, what we're offering for the role? We'll find somebody else. This is sounding suspiciously like you and I agreeing, but just from different sides. I guess because because it sounds like we're painting the same picture, yeah. but I see that as the destruction of the current Hollywood model and you just see it as eh, everything's still be the same. It'll just change. Yeah, I, I would you say model 
I can, I can, I can meet you on common ground. The, the Hollywood model is, is actually going to be maybe not destroyed, but, but remade. Yes. Uh, and, and you can now we're we, we quibbling over semantics, but yeah. Yeah, we, exactly. And we certainly agree that uh, at this point, you know, the way they're doing things right now with the big blockbuster model is, is that, that I don't see existing the, the way it does right now, five years from now. Now, one thing we can agree on is that it's time to thank our sponsor. Oh, my gosh. That's a great idea. Who is our sponsor? Our sponsor is Netflix.com, the fast and easy way to watch movies and TV online. Go, go to Netflix and sign up now. You get a free 30-day trial. You can stream as many TV shows and movies as you want all month long. They have a huge selection. Uh, so uh, go try it out, Netflix.com slash twit. If you've left Netflix and you're like, I, I you know... I don't know what they're doing these days. They have more. We'll talk about this a little later in the show. They've got more originals coming all the time. Uh, they've got new stuff added. A great place to watch television shows. And you can watch them on your tablet, on your phone, on your game console, uh, on apps, in your smart TVs. Uh, I, did, there, I pretty much, I mean, they keep getting added to more and more platforms. I, there are so few platforms, like really old televisions that don't have an internet connection, probably can't natively watch Netflix, but you can plug in a Roku to them. You can plug in a Boxy. You can plug in your game console. So if you're already a Netflix subscriber, pass this URL along. If you're not, no risk. Go try it out for free. One month. Netflix.com slash twit. And we thank them for their support of Framarate, as we call it here in California. (laughs) Uh, California. Let's go to the slipstream. There's a uh, interesting All Things D article today. I think it's actually a Wall Street Journal article, yeah, that they're, they're pointing to about the upfronts that we talked about uh, last yeah. week. Uh, early expectations are that television networks, classic television networks, broadcast and cable, will increase their total ad commitments for the fall season. Uh, but some big marketers have indicated they're going to move quite a bit of money over to online. General Motors, uh, Samsung say they're planning to shift some of their TV budgets to the web. That's good news. That's good news for uh, for online programming. That's good news for new media, and it's uh, it's it's good news. I mean, it's something that we've talked about. I mean, you've heard me say all the time. It's like I don't understand why we haven't seen this earlier, outside of just uh, the importance of people uh, confirming, you know, uh, knowing that you're not seeing number inflation. They're seeing they they want to see consistent returns, and so uh, now that that's uh, apparently that's working out, which is good news. Also, uh, Netflix uh, late, late last week uh, was pushing its original shows. Obviously, Lilyhammer has already launched uh, House of Cards, the David Fincher, Kevin Spacey uh, project with uh, Dana Brunetti on board as well. We've had him on the show. Uh, that's going to be coming in early 2013. Orange is the New Black, the story of one woman's time in minimum security prison, uh, being spearheaded by Weeds creator Genji Kohan. An Eli Roth-led murder mystery, Hemlock Grove, starring Femke Jansen, and uh, the long-awaited return of Arrested Development, uh, getting new life. And I've heard that they're not going to go with the plan of having individual episodes centered around individual characters, that it's going to be more similar to what aired on Fox. No kidding. When did, where did you hear that? I heard that. Who, did, who told me that? Uh, I think Justin Robert Young oh, was man. telling me that uh, over the weekend. If anyone would know, it would definitely be him. Uh, that's surprising. I mean, that's that's good, obviously, because obviously, the, you know, we liked the, the original. By the way, I, uh, we, I'm sure we talked about this, but a few weeks ago, I just watched the first, like, three or four episodes. Uh, Arrested Development uh, just killed it right out of the box. Pilot episode. I mean, I, have you watched that one for autopilot yet? Uh, no, we haven't watched Arrested Development. It's it's not it's not going to be on on this season of Autopilot, but that's a that's a good one. I got to add that to the list. Uh, yeah, no. Traditionally, you know, it's like you don't see any of the missteps. Like right on the very first episode, they totally nail it. Yeah, uh, I, I, that and House of Cards, I think, are the two ones to watch to see if the strategy is going to pay off for Netflix. Uh, Arrested Development has to be good, uh, and it has to compel people. But if it does, House of Cards also, I think. More than Lily Hammer, more than Orange is the New Black has a wide appeal. Seems mm-hmm. like the HBO show, you know, and in fact, it could have been on HBO or Showtime, according to Dana Brunetti. Uh, he, he, he told us on Triangulation that, you know, they were, they were headed that way when Netflix called. So I, I think those are the ones to watch to see if this strategy pays off for Netflix. Uh, a couple other Netflix things, I, and Jason, I apologize. I know this is out of order from what we Sorry. have in the rundown, but uh, Spain getting its own Netflix uh, with Yuzi's. Published launch. Uh, 
company called Yuzi exits private beta. So it's like Netflix. It's not the, they're not getting Netflix. Uh, so Spanish people who complain that they don't have something like Netflix, now you do. Also, Netflix making its way to the Sony Entertainment Network. We talked about all the platforms uh, that it's on. Now it's coming to the Bravia Blu-ray players, to most of the newer Bravia televisions as an app, uh, and also on the, uh, the PlayStation Vita. Yeah, I, that really is interesting to and me. And PlayStation the idea- 3. I almost buried the lead. PS3 as well. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, it's. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to see so many of these uh, content services coming to Blu-ray players to where, you know, obviously, like, uh, they're going to have uh, ultraviolet-enabled Blu-ray players. And, of course, if you're going to have Netflix on it, all, it almost it, – it's interesting because it changes the whole function of the device. It's – you could buy a Blu-ray player and never get around to sticking a disc in it and still have it be an important part of your home theater setup, which I hadn't really considered it before. This is less uh, about the kind of things that you'll, you'll get and more about people who make them, uh, but maybe it'll mean that you get higher quality stuff on YouTube. Uh, YouTube has added an audio editor uh, so that your videos can get uh, safe, legal background music that, that you can add once you've uploaded a video. So you can shoot a video with your phone, upload it to YouTube, and then go in and add a little background music from their catalog. This is... Uh, on- on the surface, this looks like a very small thing because it's 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 a very rudimentary tool. All you all you do is you you don't have control. You can't fade in. You can't fade out. You can't punctuate at different parts. It's just literally all it is is it just throws this on the background, and you have one slider bar to indicate more music or more background noise. Um, but this is an important step forward as because uh, YouTube is uh, YouTube has tackled everything from the distribution standpoint. And now it's interesting to see them slowly add more and more of these tools to where I could picture a year from now or two years from now, YouTube being a cloud-based editing suite service where uh, where it's for content developers to to you know essentially quickly and easily make high quality higher quality content for your you know your family movies or whatever and and share it. So it's an and, important step forward. And it, and it fits in with that Jimmy Wales. Uh, theory of, you know, as there's more widespread tools, people will collaborate more and, and make better things. I'm, I'm not saying you can make a feature film with, a, with these little tools, but, you know, these are little building blocks in the procedure. I, I think that's definitely what they're trying to head towards. They, uh, from the brand perspective, YouTube, of course, is, is pushing originally very heavily on vlogs, but, uh, but now I, I see them put, focusing more with, like, the, uh, the live transmitting tool, the, the Wirecast uh, custom version that they have built in yeah right uh, and, and this this kind of stuff i could see them moving more to a cloud-based uh, uh, editing suite new york-based independent film distributor screen media is starting their own streaming movie service but unlike netflix you don't gotta pay nothing for what? it what? go to popcornflix.com it's an ad supported bet so you do have to watch ads. So it's, it's more, I guess, a Hulu competitor in that way. But they have 400 indie films currently streaming. Uh, say they're about 500,000 movie views per month. And it's been, it's been out for a year. So they're, they're pushing it and uh, putting out some press releases and trying to get people to know about it and, and basically doing a, a bit of a relaunch. Like, oh, we're out of beta. Oh, so this, I guess the story here is now they're excited to tell people to watch it. <laughs> Like it worked before and it was there, but now like, like they're proud of it all of a sudden, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, and they're adding, they've, ad- they've added a lot more movies recently. So they're, you're, they're making that push. Uh, uh, and they, they have movies versus Hulu, which has a lot of movies. Don't get me wrong, but Hulu's yeah. main, you think of Hulu about TV. They're trying to position themselves as, Hey, want watch B movies. I, I don't think they position themselves as B movies, but that's kind of what they. <laughs> well, Sherry Baby, um, The Endless Summer. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, and even the name Popcorn Flicks kind of, yeah. um, you, you know, suggests that these are. Hey, man, these aren't Oscar winners; they're just popcorn flicks. I guess Chill the out. real, the real interesting thing here is this is a production company, and uh, they say one of the things we've done as a company while building our library, we never negotiated away our digital rights when we made film acquisitions. We knew they'd be valuable, so we kept them. Ah, so these cool. are movies that you can't watch anywhere else, apparently. Well, good. <laughs> I, I, maybe so I'll you're stuck. Try. You want to watch Endless Summer? you got to go to popcornflix.com. Uh, finally, that? in our slipstream, Voodoo planning uh, international expansion, Mexico, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. So keep an eye out. Uh, they'll, they'll be coming to an area near you 
in the future. I, I just like to throw these little things in uh, every once in a while because we, we do get lots of people write in and like, yeah, you talk about all these great services and they're not available in my neck of the woods. Uh, so yeah, uh, The Verge reporting that uh, sometime within the next year or year and a half, uh, Voodoo plans to expand. 45 countries. Wow. No, that's good. And, and it's another another piece of the puzzle. It's all coming together. Let's move to two tops. Uh, Google TV has added some ratings and favorites features that uh, hopes to, to be able to better recommend movies that are available through the Google TV service. Um, I don't know. Not a bad thing. Dude, I'm telling you, I you know how much I want to I want Google TV's thing to work. I love the idea of it. Um, but uh, to be honest, like I'm I'm about ready to go buy one. But but there, there's like it's going to be a month or two till the next round of the hardware comes out, and I'm I'm totally afraid of buying something that's underpowered because I want a super smooth experience. So it's like I, I'm I don't know. It's like um. I feel like when I was a kid reading about the new consoles coming out and like I, I knew it would be weeks until I could buy one. But I was so excited I would buy, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, TurboGrafx-16 magazines just so I could look at the pictures and think how cool it'll be when I can get my hands on one. That's that's where I'm at right now with Google TV. So I like hearing about this stuff. Yeah, it's the TV movies app, which I actually love in Google TV because it pulls in not just what's available on demand in all of their apps, but also what's available on your, your service. So I have DirecTV hooked up to my Google TV. Uh, and, and what they're saying is when you first open the TV and movies app, you'll be asked to rate a few movies so it gets an idea of what you like, and then it'll be able to surface those much better. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's, that's my favorite thing about, um, you know, of course, Netflix, you know, for years has, has been one of their major features. That, to me, has always seemed like some kind of bizarre alchemy like it's, it's a magic trick to me like it did it knew that i would feel exactly three and a half stars about this movie amazing uh another uh hack for the apple tv is around uh you can get something called atv and they've upgraded to version 1.5 the update adds a number of features like support for network file system streaming uh and the ability to manually set a subtitle offset if the timing is off you can you can adjust that this is for people who have jailbroken their apple tvs and have a lot of video uh elsewhere on the network that they want to stream to it it allows your uh your your apple tv to stream files that aren't from itunes things like mkvs and avis yep that's uh that's i did this i have this exact software package and i uh, i jailbroke my old school um Apple TV. And in fact, that was primarily how I would stream my media from my office PC to the living room. But then uh, uh, Play On for the Xbox came out. And so I switched over and I started using that. Uh, and finally, there was a Viacom study came out, which I almost put in the big story. And then I realized this is hardly a story at all. Uh, it says that the second most popular way to watch TV is a tablet. At first, I'm like, oh, really? So everybody watches like one TV and then a tablet? No. They're saying like, if you don't count televisions, the next place people watch TV is now tablets. So they've moved from their desktops and laptops to tablets. No, and, and actually, this is a story because think about eh. it. Uh, what, three years ago, this was not even a, ca a, a category. It was not even an option. There was, there was no tablet market. And think about the install base with all the cell phones out there. Think of the install base for all the desktop and laptops. And yet the tablet, a device that wasn't even on our radar three, four years ago, is now dominant over all of those for the way we consume video? I think that's a big story. I guess. I, I, know, I know what you're saying, which is uh, it's kind of a story that tablets are more popular than anything about television watching. And, and I guess that is a story. Like, oh, tablets really taken off. But I kind of knew that too. Like, oh, yeah, we see that all the time. Like, tablet sales are great. Everybody's talking about, oh, are tablets going to kill laptops? Like, yeah, but, this, this doesn't seem surprising in the least to me. Uh, well, I don't know. I, I say you're just too close to it because you, you see all this with your tech news today stuff. But uh, but I think it's uh, the the rise of tablets and as a new way to consume video media. I, I think it's an exceptional and amazing story that it's happened so dominantly and so fast. I think it's resolutionary. That's what I think. <laughs> Gosh. All right. That's it. That's it for Tube Top stuff. Let's move on to Film Film. <laughs> Thank you. 
Now, we actually touched on this earlier when we were talking about uh, Netflix's announcements. Uh, but all 10 new Arrested Development episodes will premiere on Netflix simultaneously. Ted Sarandos, the chief content officer at Netflix, confirmed this at NAB as part of that announcement. I, I wanted to keep it in the film film part because film film is all about the programs that you watch. And I think people are going to want to watch Arrested Development. And I actually got in a debate with Justin Robert Young. This is when we were talking about Arrested Development over whether you it's a good idea to roll things out you know simultaneously like they did with Lily Hammer or whether they should parse them out and say like well every Tuesday we'll give you a new arrested development until all the new ones are out uh yeah i i would have said of course it's better to release all at once that's the way we do things nowadays but Justin makes a really good point when he says that by rolling it out over time, the the very existence of it becomes a a, pers- uh, a persistent advertisement for the service, and it encourages more people to go to Netflix. Um, I, I I can't decide on this. I, I actually have no. My gut doesn't really take me in either directions. I'm glad they're releasing it all at once. I'm going to sit down and gobble them all up. But I wonder, is that the best thing for Netflix? And and that I just don't know. I actually, I get, I get the point to say like, oh, you build up the hype, you get people really excited, and they all get around the water cooler and talk about it because it came out yesterday. And you don't get that if all 13 episodes are all, I guess it's 10 episodes in this case, uh, come out at once. People watch them at different paces, and so you don't get that water cooler effect of like, hey, the new one was released last night. That's a really good point. However, I think if the program is good enough, it doesn't matter. Because what Netflix is trying to get, well, I don't know. What Netflix is trying to get is for you to want to subscribe to Netflix because they have these awesome programs. And if you're rolling right. them out shortly, it's like, well, wait a minute. I, you've got all 10 of them. Why are you holding them back? Uh, on the other hand, if you build the hype around the water cooler, do people actually talk around water coolers? Nobody, nobody stands around our water cooler. But anyway, uh, if you build that hype, then maybe that gets other people more interested and they want to subscribe to Netflix because they hear people talking about it. But I think that happens anyway. If somebody watches all 10 episodes, they're going to come and talk about how they watched all 10 episodes. And... They're not going to talk about spoilers to the person who doesn't subscribe to Netflix. They're just going to talk about how awesome the series is. So I, I think the key is uh, the series has to be good. It has to make you want to watch all of them. And I, as we have talked before, if you watch on DVD, sometimes you will appreciate a series better than when you have to wait a week between each episode. And I, and, and I still I understand what he's saying, but I come down on the side of, you know what, if you're for no apparent reason, withholding something from me that I know I can get, I'm I'm going to feel a little angry with you. Well, and I think I think this is it's just one of those like, well, why do we need to release week after week? I'm like, well, because that's the ritual that we're comfortable with. That's what we. It's the only thing we know. And uh, I I would bet that there will be new rituals that will take their place that will be surprising and you know there'll be new sets of etiquettes about spoilers and you know uh, my guess is like uh, whenever something like this comes out we'll, we all agree we could talk just about the first episode or you know then maybe you could give a hint about like oh that's really exciting what's coming up in future episodes i i i feel like a lot of the stuff that we feel like we need is just persistence of that's the way it's all it's been and that change won't necessarily change anything from either a monetary or an artistic standpoint as far as your enjoyment goes now uh lest we make you think that netflix is the only streaming service doing originals hulu does originals as well uh they've done shows like battleground in the past and TechCrunch reports four new shows coming we got next flow uh, a new return of don't quit your daydream and the awesomes right on uh, the it's, awesome stars awesome. Seth Meyers, by the way. That's uh, yeah, no, that's, that's good. I I should really wa- check out more of the original stuff on the Hulu stuff. I uh, I really just haven't at all. In fact, I don't use my wife uses Hulu all the time, and I'm I'm just all Netflix. I, ha- I Battleground has sound interesting, but I just haven't had time or a compelling reason to go. Glenn Rubenstein is the one person I've heard is like, no, 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 you got to watch it. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, what was the other one that Glenn promotes from Hulu? Uh, the Misfits, which is actually yes. a UK show, but it's, it's available on Hulu. Uh, and it's not available on broadcast here. I, and you know what? I believe him. I want to watch them, and I just never do. And I don't know why that is. Uh, I don't pay for Hulu Plus. Maybe that's part of it. 
but I could I could watch it on my on my laptop or my desktop and just don't. Yeah, it's weird. It's, yeah. We, it's weird the 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 habits and little things like uh, you know the. I don't know if it's the if the fact that there's ads or something about the the user interface or the user experience. It's it's those little things that shape like that split second decision. Like I'll do this because you know that's what I feel like doing this very minute. All right. Well, we're going to get to some of the things we have watched in the past week after we check in on the summer movie draft. Oh my God. Uh, I. Just dropped in the doc a uh, last minute thing. I guess I'm glad that it waited until the draft because this is more of a draft story. Have you seen? Wait, these so you eight- waited until we were done with all of our stories and you added a story? Yeah, yeah, right. Just this minute. Just uh, I meant to do it earlier, but but I'm mm. glad this mm-hmm. is this is of note to you because mm-hmm. have you seen all of these articles just proclaiming that Avengers Assemble might be the best superhero movie of all time? I have, uh, but people say lots of things like I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 you I know, know part of it is because I have the Avengers in the movie draft, I am actually less excited by stories that say the Avengers is going to be great because I'm just like, <laughs> oh, great, now you're jinxing it. Like, I really, that, that is my gut reaction to stuff like this because I should be really excited. It's like, great, it's going to be good, but will it make money? I yeah. want dollars. I'm going to win this thing. Now no, everybody's like, going to think it's got- they're going to go in with high expectations and then they're going to be disappointed. It's got a, look at this, on Rotten Tomatoes, it's got 97% positive reviews. That's amazing. That's this is this is so huge. This thing is I'm I'm first 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 of all, you know, game aside, I mean, you're going to do well financially on the game, but uh the uh, the vindication of being a Marvel kid in the 80s when all the DC were the ones that got all the good movies, you know, and you got shabby, you know, Spider-Man Kung Fu or uh or or Spider-Man from Japan or whatever. It's uh it's so awesome to to hear I'm so excited about this movie. That's all I'm trying to say. Well, you know what's funny? Uh, I was just saying how I don't watch Hulu, but Eileen and I, on our tablet, were watching uh, uh, the uh, Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, And there was a constant ad being rolled in there for... The Avengers movie, and it was it was brilliant. It was Nathan Fillion, right? So you got your Joss Whedon connection, right? Nathan Fillion, Mal from Firefly, talking about Castle. So it was a joint promotion with ABC with Robert Downey Jr. and saying, well, you know, Castle's actually just as cool as Iron Man. And they were like comparing and doing all these like, yeah, I do this, you do, I do that. And then uh, and then Robert Downey Jr. is like, and Iron Man has a you know a, a robotic suit that allows him to fly. And Nathan <laughs> Fillion's like, right. <laughs> that's awesome so it's like it's original uh, little comedy sketches hey, it's, or? Just a, it's just a promotion it's like watch castle and then don't be, go see the avengers that seems like a really down-to-earth way to do that that seems I like know. that seems very without pretense it seems very internet I, i'm glad to hear that that's something that i wouldn't mind having up uh, come up as an ad and it seems like it, in in the joss whedon like it must have had something to do with the Whedon's. I could, I can only guess, obviously. But, yeah. Uh, it just it just appealed to those of us who like the stuff that he. Hey, puts so on. we should probably actually check in on the draft. All right. And see so who's, uh, uh, what's coming out uh, this week? We have the Raven, which is my movie. Uh, get ready, Raven Fever. Catch it. <laughs> what's it about again? It's, it's it's the Raven. It's Ed Allan Poe's The Raven. Basically. Oh right, and it has uh, John Cusack. Right, exactly. Which everyone is like, I just can't see John Cusack in the Raven. I can nice. look at Scott's giant pile of money is sitting on three hundred eighty-six million dollars. I'm now that I'm seeing all of this um, this buzz about the Avengers. I'm actually going to say that I think you are going to overtake Scott, and that the Avengers will do. I, I think the Avengers is going to do four hundred million. I, I think you know, gonna- it's funny. I, before the season began at the end of March, I would have said, "Oh yeah, I think the Avengers has a really good chance of passing Hunger Games." After Hunger Games came out, and now it's close to four hundred million, I was like, "Huh." Now I wonder. But I'm back. I'm back to to being positive about the Avengers. I still don't know. I mean, The Dark Knight is going to be just as hyped, and at the other end of the summer, so the Avengers buzz will have died down. Yeah. I think it's going to be tough. I it will be it'll be very interesting and uh, I I was laughing at you for spending sixty three dollars on the movie but now I'm not because 
uh, I'm almost certain that you're going to see uh, a very like maybe six, seven million dollars per per point spent. Uh, uh, meanwhile, I, the number two movie is Wrath of the Titans, which Justin Robert Young had in the draft. Uh, yeah, well, I think that just really speaks to uh, how early in the game we are. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. The season, the summer movie season, really starts two weeks from now with the Avengers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because then we go into Dark Shadows, Battleship, Men in Black oh, by Three. The way, Dark know. Shadows. The the original uh, actor died, and uh, and I thought, is it bad that um, I hope that that makes people want to go spend money to go see the Dark Shadows movie? Hey, it's why I thought Sparkle would do well. That's that's true. That's I mean, true. not to be We're crass, both- but with Whitney Houston in it, I feel like it'll do better than it would have otherwise. Um, yep. So we will have. To wait and see. Let's uh, check in on what we're watching. What we're watching. Now, I know you went and saw Cabin in the Woods, which I came so close to doing. But we watched uh, Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23 instead on our couch. We just... And it wasn't because we, we just, were actually both like, yeah, we want to go watch Cabin in the Woods, going to watch it, going to go see it tonight, got some good reviews, looks, you know, for a horror movie, 80 plus percent on Rotten Tomatoes, great. And then at the end of the day, we were just too tired. We're just I old. don't blame you, I don't but... want to go outside. Uh, first of all, Don't Trust the Bee is a funny show from what uh, I've seen over my wife's shoulder. Uh, I like it. So I'm not, I'm not going to harp on you for that, but uh, go see it. Go see it now before you hear things. And it's uh, one of the rarest, best things to happen in cinema is a genuine surprise. And to say, well, I didn't see that coming or that's not what I thought this would be. Uh, it, it is awesome. You go in like my favorite, you know, in District 9, when uh, when it starts off as one movie and then becomes another movie. You know, it's like District 9 starts off as this Spoiler. mockumentary. About about a uh, you know space apartheid basically, and then it becomes the horror movie, and then it becomes an action movie. Uh, you get a taste of that with Cabin in the Woods. It's so smart and so self referential and so much fun. I loved it, and um, uh, I I will not say anything else. And I knew I would love it when everyone I talked to about it. They would start to say something, and then they and then they just would say nothing, and just say just just go see it. That's yeah. all. No, I I wish yeah. we would have, but at the time I was I was fully on board with the not leaving the house. So well, I, okay. I, is it horrible if I don't go see the Raven and go, go see Cabin in the Woods instead? No, it's, it was smart. Is yeah, what it is. You will have a better experience. I'll just buy tickets to the Raven so I could contribute, but I won't go see it. Yeah. Uh, uh, Legend of Korra and Sons of Anarchy too. Yep, yep, more of the Still same. Uh, Legend of Korra, though, is so good. Um, it's 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 so neat to see them writing. Like, it's on Nickelodeon because the first one was on Nickelodeon, but it is so much more mature. It's so obviously targeted to the college kids who, uh, who grew up watching Avatar The Last Airbender. It's awesome. And uh, I watched uh, the premiere of Eureka. Last season yeah. for Eureka on Sci-Fi Network uh, on Monday. Actually, the second episode was last night, and uh, it took me it took me a while to get to it on the DVR, get caught up. But now I'm uh, I'm there, and probably po- uh, poised to be their best season ever. Uh, it's Re- it's dark, it's mysterious, it's got twists and turns all over the place. It's bringing back all the characters you loved uh, from the previous uh, seasons. Uh, both the older characters like Sheriff Carter and Joe, but also the newer characters like Holly uh, and uh, and and uh, the scientist that Will Wheaton plays. I can never remember his name, uh, but a- absolutely fantastic. And you know, that's one that I say to people: if you, if you've got a space in your viewing lineup that you're trying to fill, uh, go catch up on Eureka and and watch this season because th- this season really is like I-, I was impressed. I was like, oh, it's the last season. Wonder how they're going to approach it, and they're going out guns blazing. Is it uh, bittersweet knowing that this is the last season? Is that coloring your experience? I don't know how much that's coloring my experience. I, I'm not. I'm not. I mean, it had a good run. It's five, five seasons, so it's not. It's not like it's cut short and you know, like a firefly or something. I, right. I would like it to keep going, certainly. But uh, I kind of thought it might just because it was the last season, kind of continue on traditional lines and be sentimental. And instead, they're not. They're 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 changing stuff up, which I think is cool. Cool. Uh, that is. Uh, well, shall we save Game of Thrones? Yeah, yeah, we got to talk some Game of Thrones. All right, Why well, didn't you put it on my list. Let's hurry up and get to feedback. You got it. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. 
Francine, thanks for writing in, Francine, says you were talking on the show just now about watching 3D on TV and also mentioned subscribing to HBO to watch Game of Thrones. I got a 3D-capable TV last summer. It also came with two pair of glasses, but since I don't own a Blu-ray player, I did not think I would ever get to watch anything 3D on it and didn't really care. I ordered HBO last week so I could watch Game of Thrones and True Blood and discovered that I also got HBO On Demand with the subscription, which offers HBO 3D selections. Who knew? I had no idea. So I broke out the glasses, watched How to Train a Dragon, and Shrek Forever After in 3D. I finally got to experience the 3D on my TV, and my conclusion is, yeah, it was fun to watch in 3D. I did enjoy it, but I would not have paid extra for the TV or the, for the cable in order to get it. And still don't feel the need to buy a Blu-ray player either. So this was, this was I put this in because this is exactly what you predicted. It's like you're going to get 3D on your TV whether you want it or not. Uh, but uh, to see it actually borne out and to get this, eh, yeah, I guess it's cool. No, it's cool. I mean, you know, looks like it's coming out of the TV. I just, uh, I just don't see 3D. I mean, we, we, I, I think we all agree now that 3D in the home is not doing well. And it's not generating the buzz that the industry wanted. No, it's not there yet. It has to be glasses-free for that to ever happen. And it has to not hurt people's eyes. It doesn't hurt my eyes, but uh, I I know enough people who are not, you know, just being weird, who are like, no, it actually, it's a strain. I don't want to watch 3D movies. Well, and it's it's so weird because they're acting as though the experience is in any way comparable to the real 3D experience you get at the uh, the cinema. You know, you and I... I disagree on this, but I, I think that, that the in-cinema experience is worth the 3D more often than not, but not, not at home, I don't think. Yeah, oh, I don't know why you're so wrong about that, but that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, Mike in Buffalo Grove writes, Greetings, just wanted to chime in regard to Tom's rant about the inability to use streaming video services to provide background noise by streaming content continuously. This is, in fact, a feature of Hulu Plus. When you're finished watching an episode of a television show on Hulu Plus, another one will start streaming immediately afterward. It seems to be random which episode will play next, but it appears to be tailor-fitted to your viewing tastes. Similarly, this is also a feature touted by YouTube.com slash leanback. Got a lot of people bringing up the, the, the leanback. Lean back. I know. I, I, I forgot about that. Leanback is weird, though, because it, it brings up YouTube videos, right? I'm thinking of, like, television shows, which YouTube has, but it's not quite the same thing. But it's the same technology we're talking about. Right, right. Well, and it's just not the kind of thing I would think of. Like, I wonder how it would pick material for you whether it, it be picks like, it based you know, on your subscriptions and your likes and and whatever you've entered into youtube okay all so, right so i haven't done a whole lot essentially when i try lean back it plays a lot of science nasa and uh, videos of the queen <laughs> that's awesome yeah uh I don't see who wrote this, but thank you for writing. Uh, hello, frame rate. I don't think we even need a Pandora for video. All Netflix has to do is add a live channel feature that plays items from your queue continually in a random order. This would take the active decision-making out of the process. They could add in the serendipity factor by throwing in non queued items that they think you'd like based on the recommendation engine. In order to get the best results out of this, Netflix would need to support individual queues for each member of the household and ratings that stick with the individual. What do you think? I think this is a great idea. I love this. And the moment he said it, I'm like, yes, that would be great. If it, And in fact, I wouldn't even mind. Well, I guess it would do. It would notice whenever you close your window, it automatically logs you out of the movie. It remembers where you are. So whenever, where, whatever device you're at, whether it's on your phone or on your iPad or at your desktop, you start it up and it just resumes it and it just keeps on playing everything. I mean, that's essentially what I'm doing right now with Sons of Anarchy, except I have to lean over and click next episode every yeah, single right. time. It'd be great if it just did it all automatically. I don't want it to autoplay my queue, though, because there's movies I put in there that I want to save for a particular time. And when I want that experience of just random stuff coming up in the background, I don't want it to be having to run over and go, wait, no, no, don't play that. I wanted to save that for Saturday night. I, 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 but I, I want to, so I want to keep the queue out of the random play. Well, then you don't have to use this imaginary service that, that we're using. Well, then it doesn't satisfy the thing I want. This imaginary <laughs> right. world is awful. I, I am moving from this imaginary world. <laughs> uh, if we got one more from Lon Koenig, uh, to me, Brian, uh, oh wait, Brian commented last week that we don't have that classic TV experience in the digital realm. I contend that we don't really have the channel surfing experience anymore with slow mm, cable boxes point. and hundreds of channels. 
I get the I get the experience of just watching what is on in two ways. He mentions Leanback and XBMC. You can have a new show file uh, files automatically added to a default playlist. The fact that neither of these options is very popular make me think that people prefer other models like TiVo's or YouTube suggestions. I think it's a good point. Maybe we all think we want something, but when it comes down to it, we don't actually use it when it's available. Mm, that, no, that's a really good point, especially about the 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 delay in digital. It's like, oh my god, it kills me. Yeah. I miss it. I miss the old. You used to be able to go through so many channels so fast. You know, uh, uh, Perface for Radio in the chat room pointed out uh, if Netflix in their imaginary world did the imaginary service and gave you an option to exclude the queue, we'd both be happy. Yeah. It's a setting. That's all you need. Yeah. All right. Listen, we need some imaginary engineers over yeah. at Imaginary Netflix to get on that immediately. The, uh, the imaginary design team needs to work that in. All right, yeah. we're going to probably me, do a spoiler zone, but if you don't want to be spoiled for the Game of Thrones HBO series, then we're done. Goodbye. Stop watching. And email us, framerate at twit.tv. Uh, tell your friends to watch us, too. Twit.tv slash FR. And follow us on the Twitters. I'm Ace Detect. If you can figure out how to spell it, he should. And we'll see you next time. There is no C in Schwood. You know, I kind of like that our spoiler zone graphic actually has a spoiler in it. Oh, totally. It has a few. <laughs> well, the, well the, kind of. It alludes to it. The few. first one is definitely, yeah. it's like the spoiler from Soylent Green, which, which, I mean, frankly, you say Soylent Green and someone around you is immediately going to spoil it. Exactly. Yeah. Did, did, you, did you have a spoiler free experience when you saw that movie for the first time? No. No, I had I had heard. I, well, it was sort of spoiler free because I didn't know why Soylent Green was people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're watching yeah. the whole setup at the beginning, and you're like, uh, and you're like, I want to oh, find I, out why it, people yell that when they say that. Yeah, yeah. No, uh, I uh, man, I must have been I think 12 years old, and my mom was like, "You should watch this. You'll like it." I'm like, "What is it?" She's like, "It's it's called Soylent Green. That's all you need to know." And then oh, it was, it that's was nice. Cool to, you know, yeah. I mean, it was it was awesome. It was, Good it was job, a great experience. Mom. All oh, right, so uh, Game of Thrones. Uh, Game of Thrones, man. What how, what is that face? How are you feeling? You, you you just did a Sturgeon face. What what what's going on? Theodore Sturgeon, the <laughs> sci-fi author. Uh, you did the, the the frowny face. I uh, I was I was uh, I, I was a game of bluff here. Like you go you go first. Oh no! I uh, there's no bluff in here. I loved it. I loved it, and it's like mm, mm. I my faith in the show is as strong as ever. Uh, I think that we were worried about being overwhelmed with more characters on a visual medium. I think um, you're starting to see the little tweaks to the story that they're doing, and I just don't mind any one of them. I'm totally fine with them. Uh, you know, cause like, like that whole, uh, w was that, all, I mean, obviously, you know, they're, they're playing a whole lot with, uh, Renly Baratheon's story and especially with, you know, him being gay much more in the TV show than in the book, but, but it's adding more to the story and it's making for more interesting characters. So I'm, I'm a hundred percent for everything I'm seeing so far. I, uh, I would disagree with you on that actually. What? I'm I'm only 99%, but yeah, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much right there. Uh, I've, I've loved every minute of it. I think it's a great second season. Uh, the pick, the nitpicks I have are, are definitely nitpicks. I'm, I'm having to get used to Stannis. He's not exact. I imagined him a little hairier, a little burlier. Like, not, not long haired or anything, but just like, I don't know, a little rougher around the edges. He seems a little clean yeah. cut. Uh, yeah, I, I pictured him as kind of a, a, a shaggier, more dour, um, you know Robert Baratheon, but uh, but uh, it's really different. Yeah. But I don't mind. I mean, it, it, he's growing on me as well. And in fact, Melisandre is growing on me as well. She is also a. She was a little innocent looking, but I I, I kind of like that now. I'm like, okay, that adds a little depth to this character who's definitely not innocent. And uh, obviously, the night is not the only thing full of terrors, as we saw yes. near the end of this yes. episode. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, that. Uh, oh, and how great was it to get back to uh, Daenerys' story? She's finally arrived in Karth, and uh, uh, I'm way excited to see all that come to light. I think that the Karth scene was my favorite in this last episode. Uh, yes. Seeing the Karthi, Karthane, whatever the... No, not Karthane, that's, that's uh, uh, Liza Locklamora. Uh, the Karth uh, 13. 
come out. I, I, it, was, it was fantastic. Uh, the guy who played the, the messenger who talked to her, spot on. Absolutely yes. brilliant. Uh, just, just a great scene, and I love Daenerys. She's one of my favorites. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, I really liked Heron Hall. I thought it looked fantastic. Uh, I, as I, melty uh, as they made it. Yeah, no, I, I I I agree, and they did a good job of just conveying the misery and just the 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 lost. The place feels cursed. You can feel like nothing can get done there, uh, which is something that they bring up. You know, with the uh, is does Peter Baelish inherit in Aaron Hall in the books? Eventually, that sounds, that sounds right. I'm having a hard time remembering. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, I'm, I want to see more Jake and Hagar. I want uh, you, right now you mainly see him just sort of significantly looking at Arya, and I'm ready to see their. They did a good job of setting up Hiron Hall. Now I want to see their experience from within, and it was uh, cool to. See. It, it, did, were you okay with the Flayed Man and Tywin Lannister sort of being their that storyline being smushed? Yes, yes, I was. I mean, because it's a simple thing. You, you got the idea that uh, it's Roose Bolton, right? You got yeah. the uh, he's a creeper and untrustworthy. And uh, uh, man, especially, oh, God, yeah, I don't know how spoilery to get in the spoiler zone because I want to mention stuff that happens, happens in the book. That's way down, I know, yeah. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I want to talk about, like, uh, with the um, uh, uh, Greyjoy reek. That's all. Oh, the, yeah. All you could say. That's all you could say without spoiling it. But yes, yep. uh, that that storyline is a fun one to, to keep an eye on, knowing what's coming. Uh, yes. And I I was a little disappointed with the way that Arya's story is being handled in Heron Hall. Uh, I I don't know why. I I'm not I'm not even disappointed. It was fine. I love Arya. She is probably my favorite character her, between her, Daenerys, and Jon Snow, and. Uh, I was just like, ah, it's not really impacting me the way it did when I read it, and most of this series does. So right. I, it's kind of a harsh, it's kind of a harsh standard to hold it to. But well, I, I wonder how much of it has to do with, um, you know, most of Arya's tale in this whole book is very internal and it's very quiet, and I don't know that visually that will play on television terribly well. It, yeah. So instead, you got to make it a about this, you know, this pen that she's in with all these people being pulled out as they're assassinated and tortured and so on. And uh, and and we can't finish up without mentioning uh, Tyrion, who is shining. Uh, Just, this this uh, is the, this is his golden season. Uh, not that he isn't good in future seasons uh, or future parts of the book as well. But man, this is his character at the top of its form, and Peter Dinklage is not letting his foot off the accelerator one little bit. He is phenomenal as an actor he brings such life to the character and it's actually this almost never happens but it's like i'm willing to let go of the version of Tyrion lannister that's actually in the book and just embrace peter dinklage as he's so the- good i know i was resistant to that at first but he is too good at it and and the thing is it's mostly looks that are different from the way i imagine it though he acts the way Tyrion acted in my mind it's just my Tyrion had long shaggy black hair and was a little ugly yeah, uh, and yeah, Peter no, Dinklage is is not like that. Absolutely, and uh, and and that whole manufactured scene, and again, man, the, the little things they're doing, I don't mind it. Like it was great seeing just how evil Joffrey is. Oh that, wow, that yeah, bizarre torture porn, literal torture porn moment. Uh, it's like, man, am I loving how much I hate him so much? Yeah, and and I think that's a good choice because your your hate for Joffrey is a slow and sort of internal build in the book. And they need to hit you in the face with how awful he is in, in TV, and and they, or hit someone else somewhere and right. make you hate him that way. And they're they're doing a great job. I, I think it shows that you have an author who absolutely knows what his universe is about and understands the medium of television included in the process, paying off leaps and bounds absolutely. with George R. R. Martin. Absolutely. By the way, it's uh, in the chat room. The moment we mentioned Joffrey, like everyone is just shouting like, you know, oh, I hate him. I hate him. I hate oh, yeah. him. I mean, I can't remember the last time I've had a television show character where everybody just loves to hate him so much. I t- that, absolutely. Uh, it, there is nothing redeeming about him right now. <laughs> nothing. And I, yeah. I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, so, 
Uh, don't want to don't want to spoil future things. Don't want to talk about the book. People get do get upset when we when we talk about things that we know are going to happen because of the book because they may not happen exactly the same way. Anyway, that's true. So. Well, we had some. We got a pretty good idea of them. But all right, uh, that's our Game of Thrones summary for this week. Uh, thanks everybody for watching the Spoiler Zone. If you uh, if you did stick around and uh, find us again next week, uh, we are on at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, right here on Twit.tv Live. And uh, always on demand, twit.tv slash fr. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.